right, brilliant. Okay, uh, hello everybody, and thank you very much for joining us this evening. So uh, we want to present to you today the results of uh, the first ever excavation, hopefully the first excavation of the Holton Farndon uh, Community Archaeology Project. Um, so I'm going to hopefully introduce you to what we've been up to and some of the initial conclusions we have at present. So the project background let's jump straight into that so this uh began partly uh through a relationship myself and nick had with the holt local history society and work that they brought us on to do uh relating to the holt roman tile works so if anyone's unfamiliar with this site it's a, it's a uh, national scheduled monument located just to the uh, north of holt and uh, it it's, was a works site established by the 20th Legion of Chester uh, to produce tile for the construction of Chester and also then adapted into producing pottery as well. So um, the Holt Local History Society put together um, a big, uh, sizable amount of funding to improve our understanding of this site and then to launch uh, an exhibition at Wrexham Museum. So myself and Nick were brought on, this was in uh, 2018, to uh, do a geophysical survey of the site to try and make sense of it. Now, the site was actually originally excavated uh, in the early 20th century by a gentleman from Wrexham known as Acton, uh, Mr Acton. He was, um, a, to begin with, uh, very much an amateur archaeologist who uh, learnt on the job, uh, but was certainly very interested in, in looking into the Roman past of Holt. And he identified quite a sizable uh, complex of Roman kilns, tile kilns, as well as several other structures over a period of many years, and recorded them, uh, excavated them, not to the level we'd expect uh, these days, but certainly enough for us to make some sense of what was going on. Now, what we wanted to do uh, as part of this survey was to re-identify them. Uh, so we used magnetometry. Magnetometry is brilliant at identifying industrial activity. No matter what geology you're in, usually the firing and burning of kilns uh, produces enough noise in the ground that you're highly likely to be able to identify those features. So what we want to be able to do was take that geophysics and sort of try and compare that with the excavations we already had. It's, it's very rare that we're actually able to do that. So we had quite a large uh, magnetometry survey. And you can see, hopefully, uh, even the untrained eye, this is uh, what's called a hilly field. And immediately there is this large thing here. That is the, um, the main kiln complex, which uh, as well as several features around here and some small features up there. Now, it took a while to decipher these. These were absolutely spot on, but we took the plans that uh, Acton, well, Acton himself hadn't produced. These plans were reproduced later by a, an archaeologist called Grimes, um, who took Acton's work, who he'd, he'd abandoned it during World War II, uh, World War I, sorry. Um, and produced rough plans of uh, the distribution of, of uh, structures that were identified on the site. So using the geophysics, we were able to uh, pin this in with the structures that were identified by Acton, but also pick up quite a few anomalies that we think are probably additional industrial features that weren't excavated by Acton or certainly weren't recorded by Acton, but mostly we were able to relocate some of the things. Now, it, interestingly, Acton began on this building, which is, um, is a barracks complex. So it's not quite a fort, it's more of a compound. So it's a traditional style Roman military barracks encased in a single wall. Uh, and then with some ancillary buildings, stores, stables, what have you. Now this, this uh, geophysically uh, was almost completely absent. Uh, we understand why that was because uh, Acton in fact left that excavation completely open just before World War I, which somewhat upset the farmer who then proceeded to plough the site out. As a result, there's not very much left of that feature. 
Now these ones, um, th so this was the first one he worked on, then he moved to that, to that, oh, to these, that. to that. So as it's gone through, his location of each feature has got better. Um, up here, we have a bathhouse, uh, which we were able to identify fairly well. It was a high status building, so a corridor building like a villa, but um, not quite. And then there was a pottery workshops, double stack kilns, uh, drying sheds with hypercourse floors, and then the main, main towel plant. Now, it was while doing the background research for this project that our new site came onto our radar. So we ha were having a look at the LIDAR and we unfortunately we weren't the first to note this site. It had already been noted by um, the Cheshire West Council uh, Historic Environment Team. And it was a particularly nice um, card shaped enclosure located on a meander of the River Dee. So you may need to move your panel potentially just to get it out of the way of that LIDAR on the side. Um, so immediately this by the HER and uh, others that have looked at it, the conclusion was this is likely to be some form of Roman military enclosure, maybe a communications fort. Uh, one of the justifications for that is you can see uh, you've got this card shaped enclosure in the LIDAR. You've also got these curving striations running through it. They're medieval cultivation. So they run over it. So that at least suggests that this feature would be medieval or earlier. So we wanted to go and have a look at this site to see if we can try and maximize our ability to understand it, uh, get as much information we could without digging it first. So uh, in 2022, we undertook some aerial work, obviously processing the LIDAR data again, but then also following that up with a high resolution magnetic survey. So you can, again here you can see the enclosure very nicely, and then just about you can see that transfer through into the magnetic survey data. And I'll go through this in a little bit more detail, the combination of um, that survey and the raw data. And you can just about see running through, you've got those cultivation marks um, that are crossing the site and making it very difficult to make sense of the enclosure itself. You also have a field drain system, so a herringbone field drain system, uh, which is uh, typically ceramic. But what's quite interesting in this point is that they don't appear very strong in the magnetic data. Now, usually ceramic would light up um, like a Christmas tree in magnetic data because it's a fired material. But um, that suggests in this instance that it's probably very, very deep. However, in addition to that, you have got the rough outline of our enclosure. But interestingly, you'll notice um, the areas to the south here are incredibly quiet. So with the, with the exception of these very faint striations, now they're modern cultivation, um, it's generally very, very quiet. And that sort of data is very typical of flood deposits. However, within the interior, it's notably different. So it, it gets considerably noisy. Now, although you might look at this data and you think, oh, well, you know, there's no very clear feature there. There's no structures. Well, there's enough there for us to realize, uh, myself and Nick, when we're looking at this data, that there is clearly some form of occupation within this enclosure. And therefore it was worthy of potentially looking at, because there's obviously several things that were going through our mind as to the possibilities of what this enclosure might be. Um, and especially with things that are temporary, you might not get very much occupation material within the inside. So for the geophysics to show that there was potentially something uh, made it worthwhile. So we really then decided to push it forward with the assistance of the Holt Local History Society in developing this into a proper project that we could bring in the local communities and um, have a dig. So that led us to our excavation in September, 2022. So um, we aimed, we went in with the aim of excavating six trenches, although it was only really five that got fully investigated in the end. Now, if you look very carefully at this aerial shot, you can just about see the outline of the enclosure within the uh, grass and the crop marks. I've highlighted that for you. 
So that gives you an idea of the extent. So with trench one and trench three, the idea there is we wanted to span the width of the enclosure because uh, bearing in mind that one of our best ways of making sense of that enclosure is going to be to look at the ditches and to see if there are any deposits within those ditches that might help us to try and date the site. Now we'll go for it trench by trench. And so trench one was that really big one um, at the start. So, uh, this immediately got extended. So we started at the western end, and as we got to our lower deposits, we came down onto a thick charcoal layer that had Roman CBM and industrial waste in it. So that immediately changed our tact as how we were going to approach this. So we had to extend the western end of the trench and widen it because the deposits were getting very deep. And in this area, we managed to identify this big spread or deposit of clay, which was sealed by a thick layer of uh, very charcoal rich clay that also contained a lot of Roman and spreads of industrial material as well. Now, one thing to note with this photo is you can see the slope of this section. So this is the lower end, uh, western extent of the trench, which is the lowest point. You get this rise, there's a slight plateau, a rise again, and then a plateau at the very top. And that is our profile of the enclosure. But that slight plateau, thankfully, produced a, the very subtle outline of a ditch. Now I must stress that Cheshire sand is a very difficult geology to excavate. Not, and it's even worse when you're looking at uh, river deposited Cheshire sand. So we have an enclosure that is, was cut and built into uh, alluvial deposits, so river deposits. It was backfilled by river deposits and then sealed by river deposits, all of which are very similar in color, texture and content generally. So it made identifying this feature particularly difficult. However, fortunately we were able to, and it was backed up by some crumbs of uh, Roman pottery right at the bottom, as well as charcoal. And I've sort of roughly highlighted the outline that we have here. Now, interestingly, the outer side, uh, so that is uh, on the river side, is a sloping edge. And then the inner side towards what would have been our um, enclosure uh, is much steeper. Beyond that steep side, we had quite a blank area of natural Cheshire sand. And it was distinctly different from the alluvial deposited sand. It was very fine grain, high silica sand. Um, and then beyond that, the soil changed again to much more charcoal flecked. So that give, gave us the indication of potentially an earthwork that has formerly been present there, which has uh, prevented that charcoal flecking. But we'll see that a little bit better in a different trench. So like I said, um, when we first opened that uh, trench number one, we immediately changed tact because we had that industrial material, um, which I refer to as slag, iron working slag. We decided to go back to the geophysics and quickly have a look at some of our industrial spikes that occurred within the enclosure. And this was one uh, such spike, which we decided to target straight through the middle and uh, a very small, relatively small trench, which identified a concentrated spread of charcoal, burnt stone, and a small amount of industrial waste. Uh, also intermixed with that was uh, small abraded pieces of Roman CBM and potentially pottery, but it was so heavily abraded that it was very difficult to tell. Although there was definitely something happening here, potentially industrial, certainly enough to, to burn the ground and sort of burn stone, um, there was not very much depth to it. Uh, one possibility is that we may have missed the feature that is there. Um, on reflection, looking at the geophysics, the peak points in the magnetic data tend to be just above the trench. 
So there's a possibility there might have been something else there that we've just missed. Now, trench three really was uh, our most significant. Now, within the sense, this trench targeted uh, an industrial spike as well as what should have been the, the eastern extent of the enclosure. Now, that industrial spike immediately came out as the base of a furnace. So this is a bloom furnace. There's not very much left of it, but it produced a significant amount of industrial waste. There's a remnant of the lining, which is a combination of fired clay and burnt stone. And with this uh, fairly compacted sand base, uh, and it is cut into the sand. But again, so uh, fortunately, what you can see in this aerial shot of this trench, um, notice that this side, um, so above our industrial feature, much darker. This was very charcoal flecked. It was very rich in fines, a lot of Roman material, a lot of industrial waste. We then had a band of, again, that natural Cheshire sand, very clean sand. And then beyond that, very different. Now, cut into that stuff at the top um, were two post holes, uh, which were cutting into a deposit that contained both industrial and Roman material. There's that um, clean band. And then here is that slightly different material at the bottom. Now, the different material at the bottom was again alluvial with a lot of iron panning in it as well. But to confirm that it was certainly in filling something, there was also some very nice bits of uh, overfired Roman tegula. Now, so the interesting thing we've got, uh, which suggests here, although we were not able to get the full profile here because uh, the depth that we excavated exceeded a safe working depth at that point and uh, we were left to dig this by hand so there was no chance we were ever going to get the full extent of that ditch but we still get this pattern of potentially an industrial feature that's been built into an embankment that sealed that natural um, sand which is why you have that fairly clean no charcoal flecking within it and then beyond that you got this much dirtier alluvial material that's infilled something, the full extent of which we weren't able to uh, reach. We then also had uh, trench four. So this was to try and attempt to look at the northern extent of the enclosure. Now, the northern extent of the enclosure has been quite elusive. It's, uh, it's not very clear on the magnetometry. It's not very clear in the aerial data either, um, partly because you've got that medieval cultivation cutting through. And uh, unfortunately, again, it wasn't very clear in the trench either. Um, we did get a rough outline of what we believe is a ditch fill certainly running through the middle. But one thing I can say is we didn't identify natural. We were still looking in alluvial sediments and uh, at a, quite a significant depth, we were also picking up um, industrial waste and charcoal. So unfortunately, this we, we reached our logistical limits again with this trench in not being able to find the full extent, um, which is a shame because it would have been nice to try and uh, get, a, get a full profile of that enclosed ditch. And then the last trench that we covered uh, was trench five. Now this was targeting a small curving feature in the geophysics. Um, Similar story here again, a lot of alluvial deposits overlying each other. Um, notable changes in the alluvial deposits in pot potentially marking events of deposition, so floods. Um, although you should bear in mind that with floods, floods take away as much as they uh, deposit. Uh, so that can create uh, quite a bit of confusion on sites like this, especially when you've got sand. However, we did get some uh, very, very charcoal rich deposits right at the bottom of that deep excavation at the back, uh, which did produce some interesting material as well. So as anyone who is familiar with this process, uh, you will know that half of the work is on site, half of the work is very much in the post excavation analysis. And this is where we really try to bring the site together and make sense of what's going on. So 
the process here was firstly a to start creating a, a digital form of everything we've recorded on site but then to start to make sense of all the finds we've taken but also the environmental samples so when we've excavated features we've taken bulk samples of the soil chucked them into sealed buckets and they have been sent off uh, to our friends at the museum of london in chester um, who have processed them using these which are called flotation tanks uh, where the sediments are separated between what floats to the surface what sinks at the bottom um, and then sieved, separated, processed further um, in order to get hold, uh, ideally, materials like this, which is charred cereal grain and charcoal, preferably charred cereal grain, because this is our ideal go-to for carbon dating, so to date a feature. Uh, and the reason I say cereal grain, if anyone's not aware of this, uh, although when you think of carbon dating, you often maybe lean towards charcoal, Charcoal is not actually ideal um, unless you know the species or the age of that tree. Um, it it's makes your date somewhat unreliable, whereas a cereal grain, you know it only existed for a season. So it's much more reliable in, in terms of how you can tie that date down. Now, the notable figure we've got here from the fines quantification is this industrial waste figure. Now, 21 kilograms of industrial material uh, extracted from what is a fairly small or modest side, sized um, evaluation. So this consisted of uh, combinations of different types of slag, which were sent over to Jerry McDonnell, who is a archaeometals specialist. And he has been able to uh, produce an assessment uh, of the the assemblage which has been extremely inform informative so this is kind of where we're at with the uh the post-sex analysis and where we're thinking now so feature wise firstly we have this enclosure now i'm i both me and nick are pretty satisfied that we have identified this enclosure it's definitely present um, the interior was noticeably different to what was surrounding it, it including the fact that it consisted of a, a fairly clean natural sand and a sand that wasn't necessarily river deposited as well. It was more common of the uh, sort of, like I say, the high silica Cheshire sands that you find in the area. Um, so, and we managed to roughly uh, work out the extent of that as well as fortunately in trench one, we got the profile and we've got a sample out of the base of that ditch. Now, the initial look at the sample that's come out of the base of that ditch has identified potential cereal grain. Um, it's, there's definitely charcoal in it. There's a considerable amount of charcoal. Uh, but hopefully, uh, at the moment, those samples are sitting in an office in Stansted and waiting for an archaeobotanist to confirm what species of cereal grain we're hopefully looking at. Once that's done, they will be sent off for carbon-14 dating, and we will have uh, hopefully a confirmation of when that ditch was cut, or certainly when it began to silt up. Now, the finds spread across the site uh, are a bit of a mixed bag. Now, we've got some finds like this, which is a uh, Roman spindle whirl. So this is used for drop spinning yarn. Uh, now, it's fairly unabraided. It seems to be in, in fairly good condition. It's been found in uh, a very much a mixed deposit of uh, Roman and industrial material. We've also got this, which is an overfired piece of Roman tegula. Uh, overfired is quite important because it's possibly a waster. So that indicates that it may well or very likely has come from the Roman tile works just up river um, and was something that never made it to a building. And then we have stuff like this, which is a very highly abraded rim shirt of uh, Cheshire plain wear. So that's roughly second century in date. Now, a lot of these finds were fairly consistent across the sites, although they were a lot of which were, were very heavily abraded. Now, the suggestion there is uh, the certainly thing that we're having to bear in mind that is a lot of this material has likely been deposited in flood events. Of course, bear in mind, like I said as well, that uh, those floods will have stripped as much as they deposited. So a lot of the stuff may have been from this site has been moved around and then redeposited. 
Um, but nevertheless, it, it's 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 acted to churn the site up slightly. But they have sealed the features that we have got, such as the ditches. So that does give us an indication that if a lot of these finds are coming up as probable second century in date, then we probably have got some form of enclosure that either dates to that or just predates it. Now, one of the considerations we had with this site is that if we've got a slightly more temporary site, like a marching camp uh, or temporary fortified position, um, then this sort of site is gonna produce very little in the way of archaeological material or structural features. Um, all you're really going to get is that dirt, ditch earth, earthwork. We did get some nails uh, through the deposits, uh, which do look very promising for Roman nails. We need to get that confirmed. But um, now this is uh, another site at Wilderspool in Warrington. This was also a work site that was established by the 20th Legion. And um, this was a temporary enclosure that was also identified uh, during excavations at Wilderspool and is believed to be associated potentially uh, with guarding a crossing point of the river. So there's a potential that we might have a similar situation here. Is it maybe related to that first establishment of the Holt Tile Works, which was established to um, facilitate the construction of Chester? Uh, what's interesting about the, the Holt site is the, the lack of defensibility of the site in general, the, the compound of the barracks, although, although we're not 100% sure of the dating of that compound, it may well have been a later feature that was added. Um, but it, its general defensibility seems to be quite poor, there's no ditch attached to it, it's just a simple walled compound. Um, so this is the potential for what we've got here. Now we have the industrial activity. So our reasoning as we left site is that this industrial activity was likely to be an afterthought. It's something that has reused this enclosure at a later date. It's very unusual to find a sort of purpose-built rectangular enclosure for establishing industrial activity. So when I say industrial activity, I mean iron smelting. So like I said, this was a bloom furnace so the idea being is you load it with iron ore and charcoal, and uh, that is then heated as much as possible, which separates uh, the unwanted material from the more purified iron. It didn't melt the iron, it just uh, it produces a clump in the center known as the bloom, which is then taken off and hammered to get the rest of uh, the unwanted material from it. Now, all this industrial waste was analysed and produced some fairly interesting information. So we have uh, six distinctive types of industrial material. We have tap slag, smelt slag, slag lining, slag tubes, slag cake, and high metal content and ore. So there's some very interesting things to note with this. So tap slag we, is the material we usually refer to as the stuff that has been released from the, the furnace, which is a basically a, looks like a clay uh, lined anthill or um, a termite hill, I should say. Um, once you've reached that full temperature, what would normally happen is a rod would be rammed into the side and the molten material would pour out uh, like a tap. Um, now, there are five of these types of uh, industrial material have something in common, and that is the tap slag smelt slag lining, which is uh, where you've got the slag and the fired clay still joined to it, which is the lining of the furnace itself. Uh, smelt slag is the heavier stuff at the bottom of the furnace. Slag tubes, which are um, semi-molten slag that's formed within the blowholes of the furnace. And then of course the ore, which is the stuff we're melting. Uh, and then notice where they are occurring. So they're all within our uh, furnace. The odd one out is the slag cake. Now, interestingly, slag cake is more commonly associated with smithing or forging. So that's quite exciting in itself because it suggests uh, that you've got 
potentially some form of production line. Now, bear in mind, we didn't find uh, a, an industrial feature at that end of the trench. There was certainly a lot of charcoal, a spread of material. We did have our industrial feature here in trench two, which we may have just missed the edge of it. And like I say, it was, it was slightly thinner. Um, so there's a potential that you may have the smelting going on on one side, the material being taken over to the other and then processed. Now, that was interesting. Uh, it gets even better. Now, um, there was something quite significant noted about the tap slag. The, the tap slag from our furnace has not reached full fluidity, by which I mean it, it didn't uh, reach a high enough melting point that it would freely pour. Sorry, freely pour. Um, it said it was still quite um, pasty. Now, um, it's also noted that this is not a suitable location for uh, melting iron, certainly not by the Roman standards. Uh, one of the reasons being it is too close to the water table. So a lot of the heat of that furnace would be lost through the bottom. And one of the reasons why it's not reaching a high enough temperature to melt the material we don't want um, for it to be tapped out of the furnace. But that's brilliant because that puts this into a particular category of furnace, namely a non-tapped furnace. And they fit into two particular chronologies. One is Iron Age and the other is the early post-Roman and earliest uh, early medieval. That's the period that we used to refer to as the Dark Ages. Now, since a lot of our industrial material is intermixed with Roman material, by the law of stratigraphy, that can only mean that this feature is post-Roman. So that makes this really quite particularly exciting. Uh, this sort of activity or production in general from that early post-Roman period after the Roman withdrawal of Britain is scant. It's almost non-existent. We don't find many sites, um, and especially when it comes to metalworking. In fact, for the whole entire early medieval period, uh, iron smelting sites, proven iron smelting sites, are fairly few in number. Um, so to actually identify one here that we've got a direct relationship as well with uh, potential Roman enclosure uh, predating it, that's made this really quite interesting. Now, I should note that this is subject to carbon dating. So we have got material out of that furnace, which we are going to, uh, which is again, awaiting analysis by our um, archaeobotanist. And um, we need to send that off. I would say, however, and uh, not to seem too overconfident, but should the, that date come up with something different, like Roman, like Iron Age, um, it would be very difficult to make sense of, very difficult indeed. And whilst there is still a possibility that this activity could be Roman, it could be associated with locals uh, that are undertaking uh, iron working out of the supervision of uh, Roman law, Roman authorities or Roman industry. Um, that would, however, make this site very unusual, which I suppose is interesting in itself. Uh, but that does mean that our most likely explanation is that this is either into that very late Roman period or into that early post-Roman period. So uh, very exciting indeed. Now, one thing um, to note, so this is back to a representation of that magnetic data in the geophysics. Again, remember, magnetic data, very good for identifying industrial sites. Now, the first feature that we looked at um, was that one. And notice that right next to it is another one that was just outside of the trench to the south. But throughout the interior of this enclosure, there are loads more. And many of these may well be additional industrial features. Some of them may just be topsoil debris. Uh, the most notables are these, which um, 
Again, we managed to put our trench right through the middle of this possibility. The thing that we needed to look at was just above it. Uh, same with this one. So uh, the focal point of the magnetic spike was just outside of trench four that we excavated. We actually went through this portion, which was uh, corresponded with uh, another spread of more charcoal rich material uh, within the top of the trench. Um, so there's a potential there may be something else going on nearby although there wasn't that much in the way of industrial material picked out from that trench um, that would really shout that it was next to something um, sort of uh, like a furnace. However, bear in mind that there's potentially lots of different forms of industrial activity going on in this site where, where you have a furnace, uh, you've also got potentially got that smithing activity, but you also need the charcoal burners that are needed to fuel that furnace. Uh, it's generally charcoal that would be used in, in a bloom furnace. Um, so they would be burning charcoal somewhere relatively nearby, potentially inside the enclosure, potentially immediately outside. Um, so this is things we need to consider moving forward now. Do we uh, continue to investigate this site? Um, our initial plans had been to move um, up onto the ridge um, and to look at potential domestic sites where people uh, associ associated with the tile works and um, other activity around Farndon may have been living uh, because there's a considerable amount of Roman material does come up in Farndon, um, which has always uh, hinted at the possibility of a settlement somewhere in Farndon, um, but it's never been fully identified. So, in addition to those two features, we've got the general activity in the area that's been hinted through some of our finds. Um, so in trench five, in that uh, very charcoal rich deposit I mentioned that was at the bottom of the trench, uh, we had this very nice partly worked flint. Uh, it's not particularly abraded, which suggests it might maybe hasn't necessarily been deposited by the river or certainly hasn't been knocking around in the river too long. Um, Obviously important to know, uh, flint does not naturally occur in this area, although it can be deposited by glacial material. Um, it tends to be uh, much more abraded in that sense uh, or in that context. Um, so this is a, a reasonable indication of prehistoric activity. Uh, you've also got this uh, uh, later Roman coin, so fourth century coin of Licinius. Um, this has also occurred within an upper deposit of alluvial material, um, so is likely to be a, a relative afterthought to the site or post-dating any major activity we have on the site. And then we also had loads of these, which are lead fishing weights. Um, now, in terms of dating, uh, they can be extremely difficult to date. Uh, technologically, they've been the same from the later Iron Age through to the early post-medieval period. Um, they are simply a flat bit of lead that is wrapped around a string. Um, and they do help to further support that image that, you know, a lot of a lot of this material we've got spreading across our site has been deposited by floods, because that's realistically probably how these lead fishing weights have been deposited onto the site. Um, so in addition, to what we did on site, we were also keen to have a little bit of a look at the river. So we uh, were very kindly assisted by a professional diving team who um, did both a scan and a dive through the river. Now, one of the reasons for this uh, was looking at the potential for a crossing point. And it wasn't just because of the parallels we were drawing with uh, Wilder's Pool, with the possibility of this being a, a fortification guarding a crossing point, but also the fact that um, the 1845 tithe map lists this field on the Welsh side of the river as a uh, bridge pasture. Um, and although there's a small stream here with a plank going across it, I'd like to think that uh, the title bridge wasn't earned um, due to a plank. So uh, the hope was that here we would find some form uh, of relatively clear evidence of uh, some sort of bridging abutments um, unfortunately, it proved not to be the case. Uh, we did get some uh, sections of work timber, very large sections of work timber, um, but no clear evidence that these would have been from a bridge uh, or associated with a bridge. Um, obviously, it's important to note that we're on a very sharp meander 
of the River Dee here. So a lot, the banks will have moved. Potentially not very much. Uh, if you look at the LIDAR uh, data for around the River Dee, between here and Poulton, you see an awful lot of medieval cultivation that runs right up to the edge of the river uh, with the plough headlands still visible. So the plough headland being where the, the plough turns at the end of the field. So that suggests that, you know, the fact that you can still see them, the river hasn't moved that much since that later medieval period. So, but nevertheless, there was no clear evidence of a bridging point here but I would say that doesn't necessarily at this point rule it out. So to conclude, we obviously still not uh, at our end point for this site at all yet. We're still half, I would consider halfway through our uh, post excavation process. Um, at the moment, we're very keen to get those C14 dates back. Uh, at the moment, we have a budget for just two. So we will be looking at the ditch of the enclosure and the furnace. So based on our analysis so far, uh, that the logic there is that one is the earliest, the other is the latest. So that gives us our stretch of um, activity for the site. And hopefully at a future date, we'll be able to put some more funding together to get uh, additional uh, C14 samples across the site and potentially some additional investigations. Um, our conclusion, I can say at present, and this is uh, this may well be subject to change, I must stress, uh, is that we do have some form of temporary Roman enclosure. The fact that this is sealed by material, predominantly Roman material, with then some uh, later industrial material as well. Although I should also point out that some of the industrial material that's come out of the Roman context, such as trench, uh, those found at the bottom of trench one, uh, may well be Roman. You may have combination of materials from nearby uh, activity that's been deposited within the Roman period as well. That's not entirely uncommon. Um, so, but then our, our big, obviously our, our biggest question is around this furnace. Uh, the typology of the furnace itself, uh, the amount of material we've got from it, which our specialist has noted that it, for the size of this evaluation and the size of the feature we've got, it's quite a sizable amount of uh, industrial material. Um, however, it, it was very categorically identified as non-tapping. So um, that's, uh, as far as an archaeometallurgist is concerned, rules out Roman. So that only leaves us with either Iron Age or early post-Roman. Quite frankly, either one of those results I'm quite happy with. <laughs> Although the Iron Age would make our site very difficult to um, make sense of. And certainly we will need to ponder over um, all plans and sections for a long time. It would certainly suggest that the flooding events have had a significant toll on the site in terms of uh, stripping it and redepositing. However, I would argue that the position of that furnace in relation to the earthwork um, and that embankment, uh, it makes a lot of sense to build a furnace into an embankment because uh, you get that thermal properties uh, from burying it into a, into a ground surface. Uh, it's all insulating thermal properties, I should say. Um, and the, the, the nature of the enclosure screams more, far more Roman than Iron Age. So again, for it to be Iron Age, a lot of other things won't make sense. So the only thing at present that does make sense is early post-Roman. So hopefully uh, that's at least got people's uh, interests uh, up. Obviously, um, uh, there was a little bit of a misleading title in this, in that I said Roman industry on the River Dee, although we did cover uh, the tile works to begin with. Um, I'm afraid when we announced this talk, we hadn't yet had those results from the furnace. So we were leading with the possibility of these being late Roman features. But in fact, the likelihood is that they are early post-Roman. So um, thank you very much for listening. And uh, myself and Nick will hopefully now open the floor to any questions that people might have.